Global Fund audience and to my new friend, Chaim. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So as we're talking, you are in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Do I have that right? That is right. I'm in, at the University of Arkansas cool. for the time being. Right. So Chaim is a uh, math professor, author of many books, and someone who loves to help children uh, love math and, and become interested in it. And so we're going to have a really fun conversation. Before that, I'm going to give a little background. I am Laura Hart. I am the founder of RoboFun. We are currently located at 102nd and Broadway, where we offer classes for children, uh, 3 to 13, in an effort to help them love learning in many different contexts, specifically in STEM or STEAM, uh, in robotics, in coding, in animation, and in um, sort of electrical engineering through Minecraft. And I had the pleasure of meeting Chaim a couple of weeks ago at a MoMath conference, which is the National Museum of Mathematics, um, where he was running around with this strange looking foam contraption that of course interested me because it was strange and interesting looking. Um, and we started talking and I learned that, you know, our fields are sort of right next to each other and very much woven together. And so I wanted to bring him on uh, to talk more. Uh, for those of you new to RoboFun, we offer all of these classes, camps. We're in our last week of, of summer camp. Um, we have an open house coming up on the 10th of September. Go to robofun.org. The open house will tell you, will it be a chance to meet me and my amazing staff in person um, and to learn about our after school offerings as well as our vacation day offerings. Um, so now let's move into learning about Chaim. One more thing that my staff always tells me I forget. So you want to go to robofun.org. If you like what you're hearing today, please like this because those likes help our social media status a lot. So we appreciate it. So Chaim, tell us, how did you become someone who absolutely loved math? That's a tough one. You know, like, um, you know, some of my earliest memories are of playing with geometric tiles and things of that sort. And so I guess I was always inclined towards that. And, um, you, you know, just uh, my mother was a Montessori school teacher, so I had the benefit ah. of a lot of hands on activities that way. And um, just, you know, in a, a few influential adults around, I was lucky enough to be introduced to MC Escher's work as a child and mm -hmm. uh, got into interested in polyhedra and puzzles and and I was interested in all kinds of things right science mm -hmm. reading and all that sort of stuff but slowly I realized that most of the things that were interested in the most were mathematics and then eventually just became a mathematician and a math math teacher and a math expositor and and so on cool so um the topic that we want to talk about somewhat is how do we make math relevant and interesting to children? And we had a, a little talk earlier today and you're like, oh my God, that's so easy. So you want to talk about how you think about is making what you said? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, okay. Let's say you had easy avenues for, for making it interesting to them. Well, so I think in general, one thing that has to be said up front is that um, to actually really succeed in the long run, to actually really use these tools, as we know, I mean, math does have a deserved reputation and it's a proper one that it is a lot of hard work. It is a lot of time and it's a lot of just sort of processing stuff. And of course, it takes years and years and years. And that that knows, has all sorts of attendant problems. You know, there's a, an increasingly narrowing pipeline that starts, you know, around kindergarten, I guess. And by the time you get up to the more advanced reaches of engineering mathematics or something, there's a very small number of people that really have made it through. And, and that has a lot of implications for society and, uh, you know, just really very seriously. For example, the divert, lack of diversity that still remains among faculty at, um, you know, most institutions, among math, most math departments. So we really have to build the pipeline, which means, and just in general, we want to have all children rise to the level of their potential. And so, um, but the thing is, it's not just the grunt work of, I mean, that is the foundation, but that's like saying that, you know, understanding how to appreciate literature is all about the grammar, right? I mean, you do need the, you do need that stuff, but you need to go beyond it and see what's compelling and interesting. And that can be done from the earliest 
stages. That's, I think, what's really genuinely, generally missing from our education, the way we educate our children um, today. So, um, so it's not so much that, say, drilling, you know, doing all those multiplication tables is super important, but also just doing a lot of interesting stuff that happens to involve a lot of multiplication is even more important, you know? And so just sort of continually incorporating those kinds of exercises into just sort of natural play and games mm -hmm. and so on is really uh, very effective. And I was reminded, so Martin Gardner, who is um, somebody who is worth really knowing about, he was amazingly influential, G-A-R-D-N-E-R, -E sorry, G-A-R-D-N-E-R, Martin Gardner, um, he was, let me put his name into the chat. He okay. was, um, he was so, immensely influential in sort of promoting puzzles and games and so forth through math, as a way of understanding mathematics and throughout the 20th century. And he really reshaped a lot of, of, of stuff. He was an ad, absolute adamant advocate for this, incorporating games and play into the curriculum to support the, um, to support the learning and and has lots of examples i guess if you look at and look him up you'll find lots of things and things influenced by him okay all right but i've got one to share with you right now that i think exemplifies what i was going to say do you have a calculator do you have a phone calculator me oh my goodness you're putting me on the spot yes oh, I do. i'm just going to ask you to do something and then the, the thing that would engage the children would be to to figure out why this works and i won't leave it so i've got my phone right here I got mine right here. So what I want you to do is just multiply a bunch of one digit numbers together. Obviously not zero, because if you multiply zero by the others, you'll get zero. But just, you know, several one digit numbers. Okay. And then I want you to pick one of them and keep that in your mind. And then add up the total, the rest of them. So take the total of the other digits. Okay. But don't, not the one you said, not the one you had in mind. And then and then um, and then tell me what that sum is. And this is a good puzzle. And I, everybody that's doing this, anybody that's watching this, you can do this, too. But I can't follow up. I can't tell you. OK, just, let's just repeat that. So I have three numbers that I multiplied. Oh, maybe maybe multiply six or seven numbers. All right, well, all right, let's start a, few, a few a few one more one digit numbers. All right. Okay, I'm going to do it out loud as I do it. Four times nine times eight times six. Do I have to remember the numbers that I'm adding? Mm -mm. Times no, you're multiplying. Seven. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, I got it. Oh my goodness, that's a big number. Okay, well that's okay. Don't tell me now. Tell now. Add up the digits except for one of them. Add up the digits of my final number. Yeah. Okay. One by one. Okay, so I'm adding a nine, a six, a zero, a two, and a one, three. Oh, so I get 18. Nine, six, two. Uh, wait, you had nine, six, zero, two, and a one, and a three? No, three. Oh, that was the secret number. <laughs> that was probably the secret number. No, the no three. So that's 18? Yep. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, so this is actually a special case where I have to do this kind of thing, like a magician's trick and say, well, I'm not getting anything. All right. So why don't we start over again? Because no, 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 no. The thing is, so then the thing is your number is either a zero or you I think remember my special number. I, oh, I think I remember. it's either a zero or a nine if you did it right. I think we better do it over again. <laughs> Let me explain the trick and we don't okay. have to. Think. Right. So the trick right. is that what you do is you sum up the numbers and yeah. almost certainly and so what you do is you get kids to do this and then you explain the trick to them and then you get them to do this and then they can do tons of arithmetic, right? Lots of addition and don't have to make them do the long multiplication, but if you wanted to, you could. And so the trick is, is that almost certainly you multiplied a three or a nine or a six in there. And you did, you multiplied yeah. a six and a nine. So yeah. your final answer is going to be um, actually almost certainly a multiple of nine because you will almost certainly have had two threes in there, either a six and a three or something like that, or a nine. Yep. And so multiples of nine, when you sum up the digits, add up to a multiple of nine. Okay. So the thing is, what you do is you take the digits that were left out. Suppose it did sum to 25. Then I would know that the nearest multiple of nine was the total, so 27, and your missing number would have been two. So it's basically a way to 
So then there's tons of arithmetic there, right? So how do you, why, why does this work? Why, why is the rule of nines work for, you know, for figuring out what the multiple of a nine, you know, for the sum of the digits of a multiple of nine is itself. Is this a in one of the, your handouts? No, I can make okay. it up though pretty quick. It's a All classic right. puzzle, but I guess the point really is not, not to fumble around and get on the spot with, um, you know, with messing this up on the calculator, because obviously we would have more time, but rather that this is the kind of thing that, you know, kids can actually really enjoy and do and have, and it looks like magic and there's, but then there's a lot to just expand upon really quite extensively. Okay. So, so this, what, what, I'm doing this a little bit backwards, but um, what Chaim has shared with us is a bunch of math puzzles games in in an open Dropbox account. Um, and so I've just added that to the chat just so that I didn't forget. And um, there's a lot of amazing things there. So that uh, tell us more about what's there. And then um, if you want to share another puzzle or two. OK, so I'm a research mathematician is my job. Yep. I've been involved with um, you know, so what that means in practice in the United States is that I work at a university mm -hmm. and teach college level courses and do, you know, mathematical research, whatever that might be. And um, but I've always prior to that, uh, ever since I was really a student myself, I've been interested in, you know, making engaging and fun and cool things that kind of really can reach people. And um, and so I put a number of those into the Dropbox. There really wasn't any particular order to it, but those are mostly materials that uh, I've used with kids around 10 to 12, eight to, okay. eight to 12. So, um, and I guess in the second link there, there's also um, a link to a lot of polyhedra stuff, which I've developed over years and years as part of that, that is more of a cohesive body of work. So there aren't particularly instructions, but that's uh, sort of the nature. I guess I could just show you a couple of the things. Why don't yeah, I do that? A great idea. So why don't we? I think it might be helpful for lay people to define the term polyhedra. Oh, polyhedra. Well, that's what's mostly behind me. It's this stuff. <laughs> Here's one right here. So poly meaning many. Well, hedron is a funny word. Hedron doesn't. There's only two other common English words that have it, according to John Conway, and you won't come up with them quickly unless you're really right. good at stuff. Cathedral. Cathedral. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. Yep. And then this technical term, synhedron, which was a gathering of the Jewish elders in Alexandria. So, okay. so what's the connection? The cathedral is the seat of the bishop, mm -hmm. I guess, is the connection. That's what John Conway tells me. And then the polyhedron is a multi-seated uh, shape. Multi so for those of us who don't know, who is John Conway? Oh, sorry. John Conway is... Um, a very famous mathematician who passed away a couple of years ago, but also who I co-wrote, had the wonderful opportunity to write a book with. And, um, but also is the sort of person who would actually know stuff like that, the fact that there are two, only two other English words right. that have written Hedron. He knew he was a fountain of all kinds of arcane and interesting stuff. So anyway, this is a polyhedron and this is the kind of thing that's in there. But yep. um, one of the things that I did, I guess it's kind of hard to explain explain without going through the materials, but oh, well, here. here, sorry, you're in New York. Oh, there we go. Excuse okay. me for, the, I'm going to let you talk and I'm going to mute myself while the ambulance goes by. Okay. So this is something that, um, I entered into the Rosenthal, uh, competition, Rosenthal prize for teaching activities or something like that through MoMath which I encourage any teachers out there to consider entering. This is called 2D 2D. And this is really a, I wish I could zoom in myself. I can't quite see it, but this is the instruction sheet. And you notice that it has this 180 degree rotation. That's the important thing about it. But basically it's a way of, um, how do I move through the presentation? Where are the, oh, there we are. So basically it's a way of taking a, doing sort of a magic trick where you, I can't really zoom in, but you basically take an envelope and you, so here in this case, you make an envelope by folding over this sheet of paper, and then you cut it open in a certain way, and you get uh, a tile that then can be repeated in the plane. And then the magic really is that it's not just this pattern, it's any pattern on any envelope, as long as you can cut it open and um, lay it flat 
in one piece will have the same pat property that you can make a tiling with it. So this is actually a, a pretty deep and piece of mathematics that we wouldn't normally show anybody until maybe graduate school, but it can easily be done with elementary school kids and is really nice and connects to all kinds of stuff. So that I think is kind of typical of the work that I do. Here's just some old stuff. This is really for uh, my college classes, but just to give you a sense of how flexible and loose this stuff, this is sort of in an underground comic book style. I'm not actually sure what's in this file. This is stuff I provided to you. This is, uh, this is not really so much an elementary school activity as much as um, another kind of demonstration, which is uh, very much along the lines of what I'm up to. I'm also a sculptor and an artist, and this is something I've also I've done sculpturally made out of steel. It's simply, if you take, a, take these arcs and cut them out and glue them together as shown, uh, so each one of those arcs is gonna glue together to make a ring, and mm -hmm. then if you just slap those rings together any old way you want, just as long as they're tangent, it is forced to be a sphere. So there's, again, quite a lot of mathematics behind why that is, and that leads to a lot of interesting discussion of that. But before that, it's just an interesting activity to look at. So some of the activities that you're describing have this sort of element of a magical connection, um, which... Right can be a really important way to make children know that math is more than sort of numeracy and uh, learning. I think so. To, so that seems to be a really important thing. When students are asking, why do we learn this? Well, the question should be, that shouldn't be as much a question as that they're just having too much fun and too engaged to even be concerned about it. You know, right. that would be the right approach. Yep. Um, let me try sharing this, this one. I'm not doing it again. Oh, oh, so, so here, I have to. Okay, so here, here's some materials that I was making for MoMath this summer. And um, so just, this, just for our audience to know, MoMath stands for the National Museum of Mathematics and is located, um, I can't remember the name of the, the park downtown Manhattan, Madison, Square, Madison yeah. Square Park. My office used to be across the street from it. Uh, so it's 20, 28th Street. Are you, is it on? 26th. Yeah. 26, 26 and Fifth Avenue. For those of you who are eating fans or Lego fans, you're right near both Italy and the Lego store. Right. Nice. Well, conversely, nice. if you're math fans, then you're near. <laughs> right. So th this is uh, this is something. Again, these are kind of these. This puzzle, many of your viewers might have encountered in another form, but I was reworking it to make it, well, for sort of technical reasons. But this is the on the right is can you connect each of the five things to each of the five others without crossing connections? So you could draw it. And so I phrased it in terms of tentacles because um, for various reasons. So can each octopus reach, ten, can match tentacles with each other octopus? And the classically, the answer is no. So I'm not against giving kids impossible puzzles and not mm -hmm. telling them it's impossible. But that wasn't really the point here. So I raised the question immediately, is it possible to get them focused on that? But um, so uh, before you go any further, what you're saying, if you could, if I'm understanding it right, is can the tentacles of each go to each other? That's right. And this happens to be an impossible puzzle. This happens okay. to not be possible. Okay. And so the, the fun version of this, which really actually works, and some of you may have children in your lives that um, this is useful knowledge, to not mention that it's not possible, but just you can occupy the right kind of child for so, quite a while. I remember being busied with this by my elders at some point, and I was the kind of child that I could waste a lot of time on this before giving up. Or not waste, but you know. Whatever, yeah, so, but anyway, I think this is, I think, but this is a very interesting problem that leads to all kinds of, of mathematics that, uh, you know, you can further develop, including all the way to polyhedra things about interesting facts about polyhedra. It's really closely tied up. So here's some other things from the same thing. So I guess part of it is just to make it engaging and sort of reach on their level a little bit and make it kind of fun looking. Um, so but I'm, then, I'm kind of yeah. reminded a bit of Mary Poppins. It's a little bit like a spoonful of sugar. Like, yeah, you got to get good at multiplication and division and adding and subtracting, but that's really to do much more interesting things. Is, is that true? Yeah, I, 
I don't think that's the Mary Poppins model. I agree with what you just said, but I don't okay. think that's what Mary Poppins was doing. Okay. So, um, in the following sense. So let me just see if there's anything else that I want to say here. So, so like here, let's just take this one. This is a very amusing puzzle. It's very amusing to me because all of these fish are arguing with each other. The uh, ones that are connected by lines cannot be in the same tank. Ah. And so it raises the question of, well, how many tanks can you put them in? It turns out not to be possible to put two in. And, um, you know, it's just whatever. So like it's a spoonful of fish. There's a lot. There's a lot what, there's a lot here, but it's not really so much a spoonful of sugar as much as if you're going to explain something, you might as well explain it in a fun and interesting way. Yeah, okay. I understand what you're saying. To get it down, it's rather that, um, I don't know, it's like maybe to, to torture the analogy. If you're going to teach the kids to bake, you might as well teach them how to bake yummy stuff, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, sure. so, uh, so this same problem appears in other places and other forms, but doing it with colorful, interesting, little engaging things. And then the, actually, let me just tell you something about the, the solution to this puzzle is that you can make it, uh, you can put the tank creatures in two tanks if you could just get two of the fish to be friends. And so the puzzle is which two fish would you like to not be connected by a line? The, again, the lines show that they're arguing. Which two fish would you like to be friends? And the two fish that you'd like to be friends are the two that look least likely to be arguing. It's the, the baffled looking fish in the middle and this poor little fish, long fish down to its right. And the only okay. reason they're fighting, in fact, is that I made them fight to make the puzzle more interesting. But the, um, but again, see, but then you can sort of then talk about all kinds of additional stuff, you know, like, well, you know, if you just make up, <laughs> then the problem solved, right? That sort of encourage other kinds of social discussions along the way. Just to having, having it be richer experiences, not distract from the mathematics, but rather right. enhances the mathematics. I think okay. the, the discussion, for example, around social learning right now, completely, which has been politicized heavily in certain parts of the country, completely misses the point. It doesn't take away from anything. It just makes it, you know, a richer, more human, and therefore more learnable experience. Mm -hmm. I think it might be fun um, if you're if you're game, Chaim, to have you actually demonstrate how you might go about solving that, but not on this talk, on another talk. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, well, what would my method be? I think I would, you know, sort of make lists of who can talk to who, who won't talk to who, and it might well, be interesting. That's the grown-up way to do it. So kids, kid, what kids do is they just start jumping, and it works. This this exercise really works with kids, even as, I mean, I did it with a bunch of six and seven year olds, not uh -huh. all of them got it, but plenty of them did. And so what they do is they just start messing around and then they mess it up and they see what's wrong. And then they make a hypothesis and they just back in and out, right? They experiment. Right. And I think that's another thing that we, of course, the RoboFund cultivates and, but it's not cultivated enough is the sense of experimentation. Yeah. And that's part of play, right? Play is just kind of another form of experimentation. That's how you learn. You know, the idea that math has only one right answer and that that's what makes math great. Well, OK, sure. These calculations have only one right answer often, usually, but it's the process and the multiple threads, the multiple ways you can reach that process that is really what's important and what is so informative and what we really should be cultivating. I think that gets missed often. I think what what get, gets remembered is that there's only one answer versus that there are all these ways to get to that one answer. Right. And that's an unfortunate thing that's missing. Um, right. And I, so, and even when that's taught, even having open-ended things where it's not the least bit obvious how to approach what, you know, just where there's no idea how to get to the answer. And you're not teaching an algorithm to solve this problem, rather the process of exploring and making hypotheses and having them fail backing up and trying again and moving forward and and then finally having a most importantly which is often also missed is having a convincing self-awareness or self explanation where you can actually tell somebody why your method worked you know to sort of take another step and analyze it it's not just that you landed by accident in the right place but that there's actually um, something larger that you can reach some larger umbrella understanding right i mean one thing i often, I often notice with kids that that we lose is they don't 
they don't have the stigma of an error in the same way we do. It's like, oh, it just didn't do what I wanted. Okay, how can right. I change? You know, exactly um, right. So and that's maintaining, a I think maintaining that sense in a child's life is it's so hard because the school system and everything is all set up to failure is failing. You know, I tried the, the motto "fail to succeed," but that doesn't work. That <laughs> that can be read wrong. But you have to fail to succeed. Right. You know? Yeah. You don't well, want to fail to succeed. You want to fail to succeed. But right. Yes. So you want to go through many trials to get to your success. Right. And uh, I think the problem is the stigma of the word fail. For right. I mean, there's but, a lot of problems in there. But, that's but see, in puzzles and games, that's not even an issue. You know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just it's yeah. just play. So. You have so many cool things behind you, and you also said I brought a little puzzle. Do you want to show the? Oh, the puzzle was the not the puzzle was oh. the calculator trick. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Which I guess it, hopefully somebody will try it, but I guess it doesn't. It's not a very convincing trick unless it all comes off. But it but it is a great classroom activity. It really is. I and actually cool. think it wouldn't hurt if we walked through it again okay. slowly. And okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of do it out loud as we're doing it on my calculator. Oh, that'll work. Okay. okay. Just, just don't tell me what the last. Just keep one of the digits to yourself and don't tell me what it is. Okay. okay. So tell me what. Just walk through. And now remember that randomly you would have multiplied at least a couple of sixes and nines. This problem. This trick goes bad if somebody sticks to the twos and the fives and so on. So don't do that. But okay. randomly, if you don't know ahead of time. You're. It's perfectly fine because you. You certainly. Have. All right. I have written down my numbers. Okay. You can even tell me what, well, anyway, just tell me I the final the number. I'm so amazed at how big the number is. Well, well, actually, just tell me all but one of the numbers on this. Times final. four uh -huh. times nine times uh -huh. the number I'm not going to tell you. Oh, no, no, no. Tell me all, I don't care about the multiplied numbers. What I care about is the final answer. Oh. There it may be the problem. So okay. take the final Seven. answer and then don't tell me one of the digits in the final answer. And I'll tell you the oh, other. Oh, okay. Seven times uh, four. No, no. Okay, seven. Uh -huh. Times nine. Uh -huh. Times eight. Okay. And then tell me all the digits but one in the answer. And if there's zeros and ones, can they be skipped or are there certain? Okay. And any, I can skip my, in my final answer, I'm giving you my final all answer digits. minus one digit. One digit only is not all. Okay. Two, zero, one. Two, zero, one? Then yep. it's got to be a six. That's it? That's the so final. The, answer, the reason is, is that two plus zero plus one is equal to nine. I'm uh, sorry, three. And I need to get the six. The next multiple of, to have a nine, to have a multiple of nine, I have to add six or um, yep. 15 or so on. 15, there's no digit 15. So six is the digits that, that's missing. Right. So it, the answer to that question is 2016. Right. When you and then for the, for the really bonus version of this problem, you can make the kids multiply it out themselves. But, you know, it doesn't yeah. matter. Part of the thing about this that also demonstrates is that an effective use of the calculator does not undermine arithmetic um, training. Mm -hmm. You can use the calculator wisely in conjunction with it's just another tool. Right. The, the problem was when it's not used that way. It's just you <laughs> punch in everything. Right. You know? Okay. So, so, um, tell us about something behind you, and and also, uh, as you, as you select something, um, us New Yorkers have quite a treat because Chaim is about to uh, start a position in January at MoMath. That's right. So um, I'll be there doing all kinds of stuff including all this stuff Getting and including going to school. So any teachers out there listening, uh, contact me and I'll connect you to Chaim or if Chaim yeah, wants. I think that'll go through MoMath ultimately. But right. Yeah. I know, but I would just pass it to you yeah. or if that's. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's the most effective way right now. Right. Sure. Okay. So right. MoMath has a school program and I'll be participating in that. Very so, cool. I don't know. I'm not sure what to, to grab. Honestly, I've got, all right, I'll tell you, I like the thing that looks sort of like a butterfly. You just had your hand on it. It From here it does. It's sort of white and it's got arcs. Yeah, that. This? 
this thing back here? Yes. This, this is my friend Edmund Harris's thing. You can buy these. These are called Curva Hedra. Uh huh. Just like it sounds, Curva Hedra. It's a kit, and it has a, you know, one of these symmetries that's nice. It has this fivefold, uh, threefold, and twofold symmetries. Same symmetry as Nicosahedron, which is another famous thing. So, I don't know. This is the kind of stuff that you accumulate in your office. <laughs> so this is not mine, but this is sort of very much in the vein of the kinds of things I do, and also commercially available as a thing, Curva Hedra. Cool. So yeah, it's just sort of tons and tons of this stuff. And some of this is quite old. I mean, some of these are things behind me, things that I made when I was about 20 or so. Uh -huh. So you're um, going to have quite a move to New York City with all of this. Or just throwing it out <laughs> or giving it away. Right. Right. So, right. And, or, and then the thing is, I generate quite a lot of this stuff on the floor. I mean, just continually. So it's not, it's sort of not a bad thing to get rid of a, a bunch of it. And so great. What, in my conversations with Chaim, what I've really been struck with is that you want people to use your materials. You want people to also get excited about math. So to start, you're, you're, you're supplying this Dropbox, which I'll also put on the blog later. Um, but there's something personally just so wonderful about that. Um, and I no, wanted to you. mention. Um, and if anyone wants to be in touch with you, uh they can how could well, they get in touch with you i guess my email address which you have you can put into the okay i will put are you comfortable with that i'm kind of putting that's you on okay. the spot okay that's okay i mean i don't i don't know i'm actually i guess i should add that i'm a not a very good email correspondent so if you don't get a reply it might just be my ordinary blowing things off <laughs> but I'll, I'll i'll try to pay attention all right and there was one other idea that I had. I'm trying to remember. Um, if you have a child who just comes home from school or you, um, you just really see them starting to not like math, how, any ideas for parents out there? I'm afraid not, because that's all really being done by the school, and the kid is there for several hours a day. And when they just say they don't like math, they may may or may not mean math in the sense I'm talking about it, but they certainly mean the math that they're experiencing at school. And that's just part of the way that, it, you know, that's sort of what I'm fighting against. And um, certainly there's a lot of resources out there, and I don't really have my fingers on them at this moment. But if you're in a university town, particularly, you might look for a math circle or a large city, something called a math circle. Right. Uh, right. Those are generally pretty good and engaging. And of course, so there's, I, a I, of other, would, there's a lot of online communities. Right. So that, I would jump in and say, there are things you can do. I mean, you can go to MoMath. You can look at the resources at MoMath. You can look at some of these resources. You That's can talk right. to your child's teacher and say, I'm concerned this is not going in the direction we want and see if they right. have, you know, some suggestions. Right. So. But what would I really would like to see and what many, many of us have been, been Martin Gardner wrote articles about this, you know, really call battle cries is that we need more of this kind of stuff in the schools itself. And that's right. the, that's the change. And it's sort of, it's a pendulum, it moves back and forth. And right now the pendulum is pretty far on the side of not having very much of this. It has been better in the past. Yep. And it's hopefully gonna be better in the future. So above all, that's maybe the thing to advocate for is a richer environment in the mathematics classroom. Yep, I would agree. I would yeah. agree. Well, I am thrilled, A, that we have become connected and B, that you're gonna be um, just down in mid Manhattan in a couple months. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah. So thank you very, very much for your time. And um, good luck packing up your office, which looks like quite a job. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is quite a mess. All right. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. Sure. Bye.